I would hate waking up at 8.30 to put on a fancy suit and drive 10 minutes to go sit in an office all day and, and be the man. I hated that. I would, I would dread leaving work on Friday night because I knew I had to go back there Monday morning. That's when I knew I had to make mm. that break and go. And I think everybody has their own level of that. Welcome to Barbell Business. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson and Marcus Gersey. And today we have Mike Dolce. He's the founder of Dolce Fitness and Dolce Diet. Dolce Dynasty. Dolce. Yeah, the Dolce <laughs> Dynasty. The empire. It, yeah. uh, we, ha we had you on Barbell Shrug 264. Yeah. And people loved it. It was one of our most shared shows. Right on. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, they All really right. liked your energy. Yeah, All people right. were saying it was like old school barbell shrug where we got a guest who just doesn't give a shit and he just doesn't <laughs> hold back and just calls it like he sees it. People love that. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, fuck, yeah. they want to hear, they want to hear the truth. They want to hear transparency. They want to hear real talk. That's why they come to see you guys. They want to hear real talk, not that bullshit contrived stuff you see in the, in the health and fitness, but in, in the world in general. Mm -hmm. You know, For the sure. Instagram fucking picture of what life should be. And, Hopefully we just tell them what our real life is, mm -hmm. you know, or how that, their life is necessarily. Yeah, yeah. So we want to get in, into some real talk today, so to speak. You yeah. just talked about building the, the Dolce Dynasty, yeah. uh, but you didn't start as royalty, so to yeah. speak. You, you started you started in the slums. You started not having a lot of money. That you had to build yourself up and and, and work your way out of uh, poverty, so to speak. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm excited to hear how you did that today. I yeah, man. It. And I, w I want to really get into the transition from that story and starting as a youth employee and just doing all the odds, odd jobs and whatnot and how that evolution became from employee to boss. Gotcha. Yeah, and well, you own several businesses, so we'll get into that and how, you know, I think a lot of people, they may have started one business and then they find they're, they actually really like doing business and maybe they can do one, two, three others. Yeah. And that's something you've done. I want to hear about how you've done that well. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. I'll show that's a lot of stuff. A lot yeah. of <laughs> that's, that's You've got to deliver all that in five minutes. We could do it. We could do it. Don't let us down, man. Not a problem. Not a problem. Yeah. All right. Well, probably easiest just to start with your background, man. Where'd you come from? I came from New Jersey. I grew up in, in New Jersey, a little shore community, um, a, f a fishing, you know, not village, but, you know, kind of has an inlet, and, had, and that's a big part of the community, a big part of the lifestyle. Going to the beach, swimming all day, going out fishing, crabbing, things like that, clamming, you know, kids riding bikes down the street riding skateboards big surf skate community mm -hmm. so love the area that I grew up in but like you said didn't grow up living the same life as everybody else grew up a life that was very impoverished although we you know fit in in the community kind of hid in the community in our lack of means you know that's due to my father getting massively sick when I was very young and taken from the home and you know, all that that, that stuff mm -hmm. and uh, we spoke about, because like, this is the Barbell you know, Business Podcast, so we're talking about building business. And what I see a lot now that I pull from my own stories, there's a lack of drive, there's a lack of purpose, there's a lack of accountability for most people that assume any sort of success. It doesn't matter what the success is, whether it's business success or health success, fitness success, weight loss success, um, relationship success. They, they find an entitlement mentality as to why they might not be successful instead of finding reasons to become successful. So growing up with the background, I'm sure we'll get into the deeper pieces as we continue. My background in growing up with, you know, no, no food on the table, no lights on, no, no running water, no electricity to go through that for many years, not just, you know, it happened over a course of a week and that was normal life. But to never feel entitled, to never feel sad, to never feel like I deserve anything other than the opportunity to work. So at a very young age, I was able to develop that skill set, refine that skill set, and continue to hopefully refine that skill set and that philosophy of, of goal setting, of, of habit forming, of doing the things that made me feel good, that challenged me, pushed me with the intent of service. I think if I said, hey, I wanna be a rich, powerful person, no way, that, that would never work. I wouldn't be driven to get out of bed. But if I want to help, I wanna, I wanna do a great 
fucking job. I'm going to help whatever I'm doing, the task that's hand. I'm going to bust my ass in this task with all my purpose, you know, everything I have, and then build myself forward. That's, I, I think, the, the foundation of what any success that we may perceive success that we may currently have was a result of that type of attitude, that mentality. Yeah, yeah. on our drive up here, we watched a video you made earlier this week yeah. on about being poor as a mentality. Yeah. And it was, it was really interesting because I think when people think about being poor, they think about how much money's in their account or the assets they have, like the cars and homes and stuff like that. Going, oh, I don't have a lot. And one of the really cool distinctions that you made in that video that was highlighted for me was the difference between being poor and being in poverty. Yeah, poor is a mentality. And I, a gentleman on Twitter asked me a question. I, I put out a tweet that said, eating poorly is a result of shopping poorly. I think that makes really common sense. Mm. And a young man came back, he said, what if you're actually poor? And I just responded as a coach and as someone who's trying to serve this young man and help this person that poor is a mentality. You must tirelessly work to eradicate any excess in your life and tirelessly work to create abundance in your life. That's what happens if you're, quote, poor. That was, I mean, that, that, that's the, the golden ticket right there for this person. Anybody who hears that, because that's what I've used, and that's what I see the, all the successful people, mm -hmm. that's what they do. You mentioned that video, your story, and, and really how you started doing these odd jobs down at the docks and scrubbing boats and all that sort of thing. What, how did the journey begin with you? Because you started at a really young age. You yeah. said you were, I think you said your first job was like eight years old, eight years something old. like that, right? Yeah. I haven't not worked since I was eight years old. And I've had, I've had so many jobs, but at eight years old, so my father had a massive stroke, um, hospitalized, like, in, incapacitated completely, just you know, <coughs> out of the game. Stay at home mom, four kids at home, no income coming in, no health care, no, no, no insurance, just wrecks, shambles, you know, everything, the, the, the worst possible situation. Lights get shut off, water gets shut off, electricity gets shut off, like we're literally just trying to eat and, and put things together. Yeah. Um, family and, and friends and community and church tries to assist, but to a large degree, we're too proud. So we just shut in and we got this, we'll handle it. And we grind through. Now for better or worse, that decision worked out better where I turned that into better. That decision, because I could have that self-loathing and, and you know being mad that like you know why couldn't these come in or why couldn't we have lived or had the benefit that everybody else had? But no, this is what it was. So we dealt with this situation, and to take that and to grow from that, to use that, you know, at that young age. So it's like, what am I going to do? I'm going to sit here and fucking and be hungry and watch everybody be poor and watch lights go off, or I'm going to go to work. And I was, for whatever reason, I don't know if eight-year-olds think about that, but I did. Like, I was on a grind. You know, I, was, I always thought that, well, I could go there. What could I do? Nobody's going to hire you. State of New Jersey, you got to be 14 years old, and you can only work 20 hours per week in these child labor laws. Well, let's let's get our way around that, you know. So go down to the the docks, literally, where these charter boats come in and out. I actually knew a guy who was a, a mate, like a, a first mate on a boat, and he's you know friends of the family. He was probably 18 or 20. He seemed like he was 80 years old to me at the time. <laughs> um, and he had spoke about what they do and how other you know. I was like, how do you do? How do you do that? How do you work on the boats? Like how do you? And he, the chain of command that you go through. So you start off essentially as a, a dock rat, as it's called. Mm -hmm fucking sign me up next day I'm there got the job on his boat then other boats and would grind my way through and literally when I said you know in the video that I, I get paid two or three hours two or three dollars for maybe four hours of work three dollars would be a good day two to three dollars at first when I first started doing that as a quote doc right by myself and I remember now the mates and the captain and the, all the people they'd sit around and get fucking hammered you know just getting hammered after with their you know fish and they'd be selling it on the dock and I'm there getting these boats spick and span and I probably overdid it as far as expectations of cleanliness you know because I was just every scale I was getting off the boat the whole thing well that's how I started but guess what I had money in my pocket Right? And I liked it. And I had confidence. And I had focus. And I had something to do, something to drive. And I could see, well, shit, if I made $2 today, I'll make two tomorrow. In 100 days, I'll have 200. In 1,000 days, I'll have 2,000. Holy. So I started doing that. Then it was like, well, what more can I do? What more can I do? So, you know, 
paper routes. Um, I would work at a, like a print screen shop. This is like maybe 10, 11, you know, 12 years old. I think print screen shop, um, folding the shirts that come off the hot press and like cleaning them in the disgusting chemical sinks. Mm. Um, you know, and then just through my life, I had other bigger jobs but never one job at a time, always as many jobs. I was selling cars and bouncing and then working in the finance field for you know high salaries at a later point in life. Mm. You know, done, healthcare, tenure, 401k, the whole thing, and I'm still flipping cars on the side and then bouncing because I'm making you know a couple hundred dollars a night doing that, getting into stocks and keeping that spinning mindset. Mm. So when I say poor is a mentality, I never thought poorly. I thought the way I'm talking right now, which is what drove over the course of years and decades out of that. So how did you go from, from all that? that? That was a lot of different categories, a lot of different types of jobs, and now you're, yeah. you're very focused in the fitness industry. Like, yeah. How did you make the transition into fitness? So at eight years old, I was already in the fitness, probably because I lost my father at a young age, and I looked for, this is me as a man, kind of unearthing, when we wrote Living Lean, it was like almost going through uh, psychoanalysis. I was like, holy shit, talking about losing my father and how this changed, I realized, fuck, I'm, I'm right now, so I'm trying to save my father, or I'm trying to save myself, save the boy, save the family of losing. That's why I'm so focused yeah. on health and fitness, I believe what I do. But at eight years old, I was already into weightlifting. I was into, with the money that I would make, I would buy Flex Magazine and, and Muscle and Fitness and Muscle Mag International and Iron Man and Muscular de Development and all the other kind of niche, even like oh, yeah. pseudo homo erotic. I didn't know at the time, it was like this buff dude, but he's at these <laughs> dudes on. I didn't know it. And I'm like, these are weird workouts. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the protein articles? Oh, we were talking about all the chips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yesterday we were talking about how like, I, think, shave. I think that's how a lot of people in the fitness industry got to where we're at is we were reading Flex Magazine 100%. and Muscle and Fitness and Muscular Development when we were in junior high and high school. I that was it too. our internet, right? Yeah, yeah Back totally. in those days. I remember, mm -hmm. man, I, I would know the days those magazines would come out at yep. the 7-Eleven on Highway 71, you know, and 16th Avenue. That's, that's mm -hmm. the spot I would go and get it because they got it first, I'd be there. I'd ride my bike there. I was literally 10, 11, 12 years old going to do this in that grind. Uh, um, what's interesting is so you have this, you're talking about, uh, you know, not having excess, but you're making, you know, just handfuls of dollars. Yeah. And then what you do spend money on is this thing that you value. That yeah. ends up being the thing, yeah. right? That's, that was, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. That was the thing. So I was literally. So somebody else might see that as excess. Like I would buy magazines like that, yeah. and maybe my parents were like, would see that as excess. And for me, that was like the thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and everything you've set up to this point, you've kind of always been running your own show, but that's more like from a, a like self-employed perspective. You're yeah. going out, you're hustling, you're getting the job, you're doing it yourself. You don't really have a boss, so to speak, for except for whoever hired you in the moment. Yep. Um, but that's not really being a business owner. Like, yeah. how did you transition from from kind of a dare I say, employee mentality and or um, like a self-employed mentality to a business owner mentality. So at 17, I opened the first version of this business. It was called Physical Enterprises. And I was 17 years old, so this is 1993. So I was already busy as a coach at that point. I was a four-year varsity captain of my wrestling team. So as a freshman, I had earned the respect of the team to be a captain on the varsity squad. And I was running much of the strength and conditioning workouts. I was running much of the weight cutting, even at that very early age, because I had started reading these muscle magazines since I was eight. So I had five years experience, essentially, going in. And I fucking lived it. I lived it, that's all I cared about. I would ride my bike to the library and I would read the physis physician's desk reference because that's the closest thing I could get to you know, anatomy and physiology and kinesiology and biochemistry and all the aspects that make us you know, what we do now at this far advanced level. Mm. And I had that drive, like the hard push you know, of first one to practice, last one to leave, like I would never quit, never lose an exercise without fucking damn near dying on, on the way, right? So that mentality is kind of part of the mindset that when I did open my business, well, I never closed the doors, but I always thought in concept of income opportunities. How many different ways can I create capital? Can I create cash flow? So mm. I always ran the business of myself, and I said, even if you're a 40-hour employee right now, you still have to think like an op entrepreneur, not an employee. 
you running your business of, of you.com are taking on this company, Johnson & Johnson or Chase America or Starbucks as a client of yours and they're gonna pay you X amount of dollars for X amount of time or opportunity but that's the only amount of time that they get from you. The other amount of time that you have, what else are you doing? Like, like Microsoft or like Apple or like Coca-Cola. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they are fucking selling product. They are earning cash flow, right? So I had that thought as, as, as so young. Um, I don't know, I don't recall a time that I didn't and I don't know how it popped into my head. And I've read all the <coughs> self-help, I don't wanna say bullshit self-help because there's lots of great content, but that's not the answer. The Robert Kiyosaka, rich dad, poor dad, he's got great concept in his quadrant. I, I hate what he talks about about debt. We have no debt, I've never had debt. We built and bought everything we have, even our properties, without debt, we've cash flowed everything. So we're beholden mm. to none. That's probably because of the way I was raised and like us kind of pushing family and community away, we're gonna do this, behold it to none. I owe nothing, nobody's coming to take our vehicles and nothing. Mm -hmm. That's another part of, of being an entrepreneur and a business owner. So I've always kind of owned my business while being an employee. You know, being a, a W-2 salaried employee or part-time employee as one of the income funnels. Knowing my big picture was to never have to work for anybody and to never have to get out of bed for a reason that I didn't want to get out of bed naturally. So what I do now, I don't, I do this for, I've done this for free my whole life, right? I, I, I would do this for free, but you can't hire me for free, but I would do this for free, you know what I mean? <laughs> Every day, because it's just how I'm, I'm wired. But I found a way to monetize these passions through multiple different businesses and the, the real estate thing is something I'm passionate about from my younger years working in the finance markets. Mm -hmm. That kind of all ties in, that's, that's you know, the, the big picture and who knows where it's going to now. You know, I'm 41 now, by 45, I have, I have very other big goals all, all tied into this, but you know, things hopefully will change the way I'm planning that they will. Yeah, you just mentioned the real estate thing. So you, yeah. you, have, you have many, not many, you have multiple companies, you have, you have three companies, is that correct? You know, yeah. why, why have three companies? Why not just have one company and be all in and grow that one company as big as possible? Um, because I think we can, we can do it all the real estate relatively easy. Mm -hmm. You know, we can tie a property up within two days and just have it managed and run on our behalf really easy. When you're a cash buyer, mm -hmm. everything gets done very easy and you get really good margin, right? So you make the money on the deal. We make the money on the deal and then after that we get appreciation, we get rental if we decide to rental, some of which we have athletes or VIPs here in town, they come and stay and things such as that. Mm -hmm. um, the MMA thing is, you know, we're such an in-demand brand in the world of MMA with elite athletes, we have to have that available. So whether that's myself or our team, we have a team of registered dietitians and certified trainers that do much of that work with our clients and with our athletes. I'm a part of everything, but that allows me more of this. I think I'm best now in, 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 in educating the public of what I've learned. Now I'm talking about growing up fucking poor. I like would never talk about that not too long ago. I'm the best coach in the world. And you know, fucking eat real food. I was that guy and I'm still that guy. But there's a larger message that people seem to want to hear. So that's where the other kind of businesses come from. We have the publishing business, you know, creating the content. We have five best selling books. Our podcast does extremely well. We have, you know, more things growing on that content side. So some of it's liability, you know purposes and accounting purposes to have different, you know, corporations running side by side, mm -hmm. but they're all running down the same funnel. It all, they run and they support each other as they go through. So how did, so you started your first company, obviously you've got a lot going on now. What was the evolution of going from one to many yeah. and like the decision making in regards to prioritization and saying, okay, I'm, I'm ready now to start this next one versus I'm gonna keep doing the one thing for a little bit longer and how, how did that whole process shake out for it, you? It changed because it started as a, as a training, as a strength coach company, essentially, right? Strengthening, I never saw myself as a personal trainer, always as a strength coach, so that's how it started. And then that grew to bring in the nutrition side because Dolce diet just sounds so much cooler than Dolce strength coach. You know, the alliteration <laughs> worked out really well. You know, obviously we have a great product behind the nutrition. So that kind of wrapped in and that all tied in with the MMA. And then when the UFC, Zufa contacted us to create and write and star in UFC Fit, we realized that's a completely different animal and it's a different feel that we had been running in anyway. So that was the second business and we have other, you know, things that run off of that that are, you know, excellent businesses, you know, in their own right outside of the, the, the scripted nutrition. Mm -hmm. So we have the nutrition, the online site, the one-on-ones, like all these different things. Then we have the media content that we push out different. And then we have, we have four 
companies, truly. We have the real estate. I don't typically mention the real estate because it's kind of outside of the sphere, but we have the real estate, which is, you know, by itself awesome. That's probably the biggest piece of it, you know, for most people in real estate. Um, and then we have a nonprofit organization called the Chu Foundation, and that's dedicated to eradicating childhood obesity and eating disorders. And it's completely self-funded by us and by our companies. So we haven't asked for any outside dollars as of yet, simply because we don't have the time yet or the infrastructure to really go hard in the market. But within the next few years, that's that's where we plan on being. Beautiful. Yeah, there's um, a lot of gym owners and people who we talk to on a regular basis are constantly asking, like, how do I know when it's right to transition into that next that, that next phase? You know, what what do you say to the person who feels like they've got an abundance of opportunities and ideas, and let's say they've got their gym going, they're they're in the first few years? What would you say to that person? And, and figuring out what to do next. Start right now. You have to start immediately. Start with what you have, where you are. That's how we do this, and we slowly grow it. If you're an employer right now, awesome. That's a guaranteed paycheck on Friday. You already have a step up on other entrepreneurs or small business owners, startups that are trying to grow and build. So start, like what's, and you know, business plans, everyone's like the business plan, the business plan, the mission statement. That's such a fluid document and concept for us. I've sat down so many times trying to write these strict business plans and mission statements, the whole, you know, corporate kind of thing. And that there's, there's something to the concept. We've been so fluid here. Once we tried to go corporate, we tried to do that hard line thing is where we stuttered and we had challenges where we become much more fluid and more responsive to the market while staying true to our core values. That's where we have infinite success. That's where we can really just drive the lane uncontested. So that's what we continue to do. Yeah, I think it's important to, as you're, as you're learning building businesses and seeing how much structure do I need versus how little do I need, how fluid can I be, yeah. you, you have to be honest with yourself and acknowledge your, you know, we do this a lot with like from the masterminds and acknowledging from your personality type to how you actually execute. Am I, are you a starter? Are you a finisher? Are you the idea person? And like really kind of understanding your lane within the overall ecosystem of what you're moving forward yeah. and saying, okay, do I need a lot of structure to like stay focused and on track or do I not? Yeah. But um, it, it's an important step, I think, as you're starting to scale to kind of look back and know your place within your own system so that you can put yourself to your own advantage. Yeah, absolutely That's agree. Yeah, a lot of times your, your external world is a reflection of your internal world, which is kind of what we're saying with poor being a mentality. Like if you, if you think with poor thoughts, so to speak, you'll, you'll continue to be poor because you're, you're not operating and behaving in a way that makes you not poor. You're, you're, you're playing into that world in a lot of ways. So um, now that, now that you're, we're having this conversation about poor being a mentality and you are a, a business owner, you, you have staff, you hire people, like, is that something that you're looking for in a person you're hiring, that they have that same value, that you're coming from the same world, you have that same perspective? That would be the perfect world and unfortunately I've, I've found that to be impossible. Mm. And I have very high expectations. I expect everybody to work as hard as I do. Most people don't. What uh, we've had, we've had W two employees in here. We've had quite a few more than we, we needed. We've since changed that model and gone down to ten ninety nine, as you say, are independent contractors. So everybody who works with us runs their own company. So now they have that mentality. But if they work for us, or maybe if they work for somebody else, they seem to lose that. That's my, you know, personal opinion. Now. Nobody shares your dream or your vision. They have their own dream or vision. So what we tried to do was align ours with them, where high incentives, like high bonus rates, like huge opportunity for growth, but you have to produce. What we found is the majority of the employees in the world, whether here or elsewhere, once they get that steady $400, $800, $1,200 per week, how, much, how little work can I do in 40 hours? And then I'll get my three percent, my five percent. You know, I'll I'll go to the, I'll take the couple of classes and I'll get my next pay tier up. I'll ratchet up when I retire. I'll be on seventy two and I'll get eighty percent of that because of my pension and my social security will kick in. And yeah, I should be. I'll be good. <laughs> and that's the that's the mentality of most. That's not the mentality of us. And we want to align ourselves with people. So now we're also like blessed to have those that we do work with, and we go through tons of resumes to find the right people that are like this. They're running, they're doing their thing, they're grinding, they're taking shit, they're getting it done on time. Every they say they're gonna call me back at two o'clock, they call me at 159. That's I don't care, like oh, I have my master's degree or my PhD. So do a lot of fucking people. A lot of people have that. It's the people that are actually gonna utilize it or utilize the, the lesser skills that they may have, maximally, you know, utilize those skills into those that are just spinning in chairs, you know, six hours on an eight hour work day. 
Mm -hmm. That's unfortunate. I'm gonna spin it in fucking chairs. Yeah. yeah, this has been great talking about the mentality coming first and it, and it being something that is, if it's not gonna externalize in your life. Yeah. If you have a poor mentality, then you're gonna experience poverty around you. Yeah. That's been, I, I think, I, I really enjoyed that. I think people listening are gonna get a lot out of that specifically. That's the takeaway. Hopefully that's what they take away from this. Some people get mad at first when they hear that because they're feeling sad. Woe is me. You don't know how it is. I know how, I know how it is. And a lot of other people know how it is. And a lot of pe other people will sit where they do and not get any better or they will fucking mm -hmm. rally against it and they will make it better. And they'll get inspired and they'll push. So hopefully that's that because that's the takeaway. Mm -hmm. We want everybody to be out there with abundance eating those fucking apples whenever they want to. Yeah. You know, that, that's the goal. Yeah. I, I think it's important to point out that, that it's not easy to do. Like if you, if you did grow up in a situation like you where you don't have electricity or running water or and you have no idea where your next meal is coming from and then someone comes in and says like, oh man, poor's a mentality, like that person might hear that as like, well, it's your own fucking fault. Like, yeah. you know, just deal with it. And like, it's not, a, it's not a fun thing to hear if you're in that situation because if you, if you find yourself with an abundance mentality a week later, well, you still don't have any money. Yeah. Like you, it's gonna take you likely years to pull yourself out of that. It's gonna take a long time. You're gonna have to grind. You're gonna have to fucking work to pull yourself out of that. So uh, we recognize that it's not easy, but it, it is one very good way to pull yourself out is to change your mindset first and then operate within that, that internal world and guide yourself out over the course of many months or years. That's it. That's why we're here. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get your chops. You know, I mean, I think we all have our, our starting point and some are the circumstances in, in one side of our life are easier and versus the other, you know, where you're with poverty and all that. It's like we all have our different kind of baggage we start with. But ultimately, it comes down to saying, OK, I'm making the decision to move forward and, and make something happen. And like you said, rally and, and just fucking muscle through it. And you're going to have the growing pains. It's, it's part of it so that you can actually have context down the road when you get there. And, you know, people are asking, like, well, it's fucking easy for you now and it's just like yeah it's because I, I already did the 10,000 hours buddy yeah it's yeah, like yeah. it's like I, I already did the shit jobs I sat there with no money and was sleeping in my car and being like fuck am I gonna do how am I supposed to pay this bill tomorrow yeah. like I, I've got to pay it in the morning and I don't know what to do you know oh. and you're like you just start figuring it out and when someone comes in they give you you know a, a, sa a sob story or something you can be like look I now see where you're at now let me help you yeah. you said something in a and actually in the shrugged episode where you're like dude we'll, I'll meet you where you're at yeah. if you're willing to do it like I don't actually give a shit where you are but if you're willing to acknowledge where you are and then actually move forward and do the work I'll be with you every step of the way you know and that's um, I think a lot of people need that when they're when they're really getting moving because they don't necessarily know fuck man this sucks like what do I do and how, how do I get out of this you know find a mentor find someone who inspires you and sometimes it's in our family sometimes it's an internal drive that you can tap into but um, yeah man it's a uh, it's it's one of those things where you you have to go through the process I I personally think to to grow up and get stronger and be able to make the, the better decisions down the down the road and yeah it's um, yeah, it's a, it's a soft spot for me. I, I have conversations every single day with people who are struggling yeah. and people who are like, fuck, man, what do I do? How do I do it? How do I solve this problem? It's like, dude, you're talking about the wrong thing. It's your mindset, man. Yeah. It's not the fucking marketing trick. It's not your intro session yeah. structure. It's your attitude. You're not calling people back. You're not fucking staying up late to hustle. You're not like making it happen so that you can be here all day. Yeah. That's your problem. That's it. That's the problem. I love you know? it. You know, the reality is that almost everything you do is a result of how you think and behave. You know, not just being poor, but, yeah. but being fat or, or dating the person that you want to date or it doesn't really matter. Everything that happens in your life is a result of your thoughts and then by your thoughts, your actions. Yeah. So, you know, if you, if you are overweight, you probably think much differently than someone who's in, in fantastic shape. Like you probably make way more exceptions with what you eat. You probably make way more exceptions about how often you work out. You know, well, it's just one Coke no big deal but then it's no big deal four times six times ten times a day yeah. like people that are overweight and people that are crossfit games athletes they, they do not think the same about how they should operate day to day with the choices that they make absolutely and fitness is the way you look reflects the way you think the way you feel people get pissed when they hear that too and they blame genetics and being big boned or whatever but it's relative to what your genetic potential potential should be mm -hmm. and very few people, you know, achieve their genetic potential. Very few people strive. Very few people even believe they have some sort of greater potential within them as they live that life of obesity or gluttony or self-loathing or, you know, apathy, whatever it may be. Yeah. But that's no kind of life to live. 
Yeah. Yeah. The, the question for me usually is, yes, there are variations in genetics, and people do start in different situations. But my, my question is often like, have you maximized your genetic potential? Yeah. That, that's really the question. Are, are you really like at the 99th percentile of your genetic potential, or are you at the 20th percentile? Yeah. If you're at the 20th percentile, then you have nothing to complain about. If, if you are at the 99th percentile and you're doing everything completely right, you show me your training plan, you show me your nutrition, you show me your daily habits, you show me your morning routine, you show me your sleep habits, et cetera, and you're doing it all right, and you, you still are a total mess fitness-wise, then, well, that you, you just pick the wrong parents. Yeah. That's a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should have started earlier. <laughs> Let's take a break, and when we come back, I want to talk about you've actually you've done so much in business, and then uh, it's you've scaled back certain things, like yeah. going to a studio. Yeah, yeah. My name is Jake Sorokman. I'm the owner of Athletics United, home of Cross and Seek and Destroy. Before working with my business coach, um, there was real no direction. There was no real authority as to what needed to get done and what was going to help us strive to get to the next level. And I think with him, it really focused and pinpointed where we needed to go as a business and what was going to help us excel to get to the next level. Since working with our business coach, things have really got put into place. Um, I have a lot more direction as to let my staff know what needs to be done to reach those weekly and monthly goals. And with our business coach, he makes sure it's getting done. We started to see a lot of changes very quickly uh, within the first few weeks of working with everyone. It really helped us organize things so that we were able to do things we love, which is learning the box. We've seen a, a huge success in our monthly membership rates. As were before working with them, we were at about that 10 to 12 members a month. Now within the first four or five months, we're reaching that 20 to 25 members in a month. So just in over four months, we've done over 100 members, which has been huge in, in this time. It's really allowed me as a business owner to not so much step away from the business, but to put more into the business. Um, the things on the back end now being more organized and, um, you know, just have a purpose of what needs to get done. It's freed up some time with my family to be able to spend extra time on weekends with my daughter and do the things that I generally want to enjoy doing. I would have to say the favorite part about this program has just been uh, the mentoring. The, the, the extra help, the extra hand, the extra guidance um, for someone like myself who thought they had reached the top and was able to do whatever they needed to do. These guys just 360 and just taught me a whole new aspect on the business and, and really striving to make it better. I would say anyone out there that's looking to work with Barbell Business is it, it's, it's a no-brainer. It's something that should be done with every business owner to make their business strive to become what you want it to be. Um, they're going to not only help you along the way, but they're going to show you the tools, what it takes to, to be the best you can be. And we're back with Mike Dolce. And on the first half, we covered a lot of the mental side. You know, what is it that has to be different about us before we can see the external environment change? And I want to dig into the, the specifics of your transition, how you went from, you know, uh, working for other people as an employee, what that looked like as an employee, and then how you transitioned to being a business owner. So, being an employee was you know, been always been an employee at the same time without having an employee mindset. I think that's an important distinction. But as an employee, I don't recall a job I ever had that I didn't rise rapidly and become a leader or management, general manager, as high up as, as you can go. Um, you know, back in my, I, I worked at a bakery when I was in high school to pay my tuition through. I went to a, a private school. It was important for me to stay there. So I paid my own tuition. I would ride, I would unload bakery trucks at 5 a.m. till about 7 a.m. or so, ride my bike to school, and I would shower in the locker room, maybe get a workout in because I was Mr. Wrestler, and then go through school and then go back and, like, you know, work the, the night shift and, and shut down. Um, I eventually wound up managing that bakery, then managing two of those bakeries. This is like in my teens still, right? Mm. Um, same thing at a GNC. Start working at a GNC franchise is just like uh, you know blocking and facing the product so it all looks nice and shiny to running that one with the offer to run a much larger one, which I declined because it wasn't where I wanted to go. Um, that rides true. And then when I was working in real estate taxation, I went from being a property inspector, measuring properties, bringing it back to the office for valuation to becoming one of 
of the youngest sitting municipal tax assessors in the state of New Jersey, with one of the largest jurisdictions you know, in New Jersey, you know, having a $2.6 billion budget, you know, property tax roll I was actually overseeing. I was a kid still, I was in my mid-20s. Mm -hmm. But I started measuring homes and I got all the education necessary, got all the experience, did learned everything I needed to go to grow. But as I was doing that, I was also working as an entrepreneur on the side as a independent consultant for other real estate firms measuring and valuing property. So that was another mm -hmm. business I was mm -hmm. running and I would do that and you get paid, it's like 15 or $25 per house and I would grind through houses and my work was always tight. And you know, so that was like the employee mentality working for the jurisdiction, but then the entrepreneur mentality also. And doing that as a property inspector, I, was, I would go and I would go to these nonprofits. There was a Christian nonprofit in Sandy Hook, New Jersey. I would go and buy cars from them at a good value, pay cash, be a good person. I would drive that car around for inspecting all these properties and I would sell it a month or two later for what I bought it for or more. So I was now minimizing my expense. I had no car payments and I was making money on the vehicle transactions. Good running vehicles, like everything was nice and clean. That's the mentality. So employee, yeah, but all this other stuff on the side. And then to make the leap from like, I don't think I ever had an employee mentality. I always saw it that I'm, how much do I need to make running my own business? And you know, young and you don't know, then you go through all the, the education of, of self-help books and then internet and more you know, of the research and business structures and then the good to greats and the you know, what's your why and all that you know, stuff mm -hmm. um, that's out there, kind of slowly implement that into the, the larger vision. Yeah, so you were making money on the side and then when, when did you let go of the, the W-2? Uh, the W-2? Like, um, and, and you were, like fully on your own. I haven't been a W-2 since 2000, 2005. Yeah. 2005 when I left that life. Well, that's not necessarily true because I left that life and I took a job at making literally approximately 10% of what my previous salary was, making 10% to be the head strength coach of Team Quest North in Portland, Oregon. The number one team at the time, I might have mentioned that before, that's my foray into the world of MMA. I've been working in MMA because wrestling, right? Combat athletes, wrestlers, jiu-jitsu, judo players, as the sport of no-holds-barred fighting began to grow through the 90s, I grew as a coach with it. Training in Team Hensu Gracie since the mid to late 90s, going through that system, working with their athletes, I get an offer from Team Quest to be their head strength coach, making you know, pennies, you know, penny dust, um, <laughs> really. I mean, yeah. so that's, that's an interesting transition. I think most people who are getting into gym ownership, they're leaving something secure, a steady paycheck, something that feels good, yeah. to taking less money and not knowing, you know, no where the next too. paycheck's coming from. It's a similar transition you made. What was what was the what was that factor? What, why did you do that? Uh, and, and what was what was that decision like? Was was it scary? Uh, I can't. I remember I was sitting around a boardroom table. I was 20 years younger than my closest peer. Everybody in the room had six-figure salaries and whatever they really wanted. You know, nice lives, normal upper middle class, upper middle class life. And I looked around the table, and it was a Friday night. I remember so distinctly. They're all talking about leaving this crappy meeting and going to like the bar for some scotch or whatever. And all I could think about is getting the flip out of here, going to the gym, and taking my girl out. This ain't the life, and I'm looking around, I'm like, this is me in 20 years if I stay on this route, and if I you know, keep sucking on the tit of the fucking Friday paycheck, which was awesome, I need this out of my life. As fate would have it, I received an invite to go and train out there. I was working with athletes. I had known guys from Quest through time travel over in, in, in Japan for no money at all. Actually cost us money to go there. To kind of, I, the opportunity, the, the door, you know, very, you know, creak of the door opened ever so slightly and I fucking kicked it in. Resigned from that position within four weeks, married the girl I was dating, drove across the country as our honeymoon and started working for $8 an hour, $4 a day, $8 an hour before taxes. I made less than $32 a day to clean the mats of this gym to clean the mats to open this gym from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m., the most disgusting fucking gym, toilets, nasty, all old school, 
Oregon crunchy, grainy, high fiber. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to give a couple extra scrubs with the high fiber. Oh, shit, where's the bleach? <laughs> and then from 9 a.m. until 9 p.m., I would coach 40 of the world's greatest athletes for free. I was doing it, quote, for opportunity. Now, you know, it, that wasn't the deal I drove out there for originally, but that's the deal I found when I showed up, and I, I mm -hmm. made it into an opportunity. And slowly I scaled and I grew to now I'm the four-time trainer of the year. I'm probably the most recognizable of the those in the, the performance, health, nutrition, you know, kind of fitness side in the world of MMA. And that's just, you know, a drop in the bucket to hopefully what I'm really identified as and the things that we're actually doing. I find a lot of people end up in a similar situation where they're, they're at their, their job, even if it pays well, they're kind of sitting around one day and they're looking around the office and they're going, do I, do I want to be like any of these people? All the people that are 20 years, my senior, like, do I want to be that guy in 20 years? And they're like, nope, don't want to be like any of these people. I'm out of here. Yeah. Like, because if I stay here, I'm going to be like them, and I don't want to be like them. Yeah, that's it. I, I felt the same thing. It wasn't my passion. Mm. You know, what drew me to that was public service. That, that was a passion for me. I could do great things in that position, and I realized this is also politics, too. And it was so difficult to serve the public as I wanted to in that position. So there was a, a conflict, an internal emotional conflict for me. I wasn't happy going to work. Why wouldn't I be happy? I have a fucking corner office. I have a Lincoln Continental and a brand new Ford Explorer sitting in my beach condo, truly. I have a staff doing all the hard work for me, making me look smart. Why wasn't I happy every day going to get this really fucking big paycheck? I had great health care and a pension, the whole thing. Why wasn't I happy? I was conflicted, emotionally conflicted. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to do the work that I wanted to do, and that's help people. I was mm -hmm. taking, driving the train after work an hour and a half to New York City to go and train with Henzo and the athletes up there. I was spending you know, days, early mornings training athletes for almost no money at all. That's what I would jump out of bed at 5 a.m. to go and work with a high school athlete, track athlete, getting ready for states for free, for nothing almost, for like a warm-up jacket or something as a, as a token. Mm. But I would hate waking up at 8.30 to put on a fancy suit and drive 10 minutes to go sit in an office all day and, and be the man. I hated that. I would, I would dread leaving work on Friday night because I knew I had to go back there Monday morning. That's when I knew I had to make mm. that break and go. And I think everybody has their own level of that. I might have just more, been more in tune with mine at that time, or I might have been clinically insane at the time about to you know, do something uh, ridiculous. But it was my yep. time to go. I've got a friend, we were, we were talking last week about uh, choice points versus turning points. Okay. And most people wait till hmm. it's a turning point. That's nice. And a turning point is where there you don't have a choice anymore. You hit that wall. And it might be emotionally. Yeah. Like I just you know, people have woken up at different parts of their life and they go, I can't fucking do this another day. Yeah. And and they just like I fucking quit. Or like something catches up with them and they're just like I financially or some, something happens at work or something happens with their fitness or their health and then they have all these choices where they could have they have these choice points yeah. and they kept on choosing the easier path and then it turned into a turning point yeah and then it, it's not until you hit the turning point that you go oh i had the choice there 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 i kept on choosing the easy path and then it turned into a turning point yeah and then that's that's a brutal thing versus making a hard choice then you're forced you're exactly. forced to move. Exactly. You're forced to mm -hmm. give your car back to get the repo. You're forced to not to go to the school or not even eat the organic chicken breast. You got to get the frozen packets from Costco. Mm -hmm. All because God of forbid. choices. Yeah. God, I mean, I was I, there. I, mean, a lot yeah, of yeah. Yeah. I would have been mm -hmm. so thankful For sure. to have one of those at, at certain points. That's true. But, <laughs> you know, so you, you, those choices. I so love that. What happened? You go to Team Quest. Yeah. You're making very almost no, no money. Not livable. So, how did you get from that to running a successful business? That fucking work my ass off so we go through criteria here my results it's all about results right because you, your your results create your reputation and my results were indisputable I could replicate results no matter who you are no matter where you come from no matter what your background no matter where your goals what your goals are I will produce results you look at my athletes every one of my athletes produces exceeds what our stated goals are early on we exceed those we've never not had an athlete exceed their results. The same thing with our regular clientele. 
they lose more weight than they thought, they gain more muscle, they get healthier, it's easier than they thought. We, we get these results, that builds our reputation. So with the reputation, as my reputation began to grow, I could now, instead of working for free, I could charge athletes 20 and I could you know, thin the herd a little bit, then I could charge 50, then I could charge 100, then I could charge 500, then I could set my own rates and people and my time and per day and, and percentages and all these other things because my results were so fucking good. The reputation grew, and with the reputation, the resume grew. So now I have a resume that I'll, I'll put next to any coach on this planet, I'll put my resume next to them. I'm in that category. No better, no worse, but I'm in that category. That's where you know, my rewards come in. It's, as, it's as, as a result of that. So that's how I went from being at Team Quest, kind of you know, as the gym janitor, with this bright, mind, entrepreneurial mind, um, not that I'm saying I'm bright, but like that wide vision of the possibility and how hard I was willing to work to get there. But I can only work by serving because that goes back to results, right? So that, that, that's the loop that, that we're in, I think, that allows us to drive forward. Re rewards is not the, 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 the precipice. Rewards is, is not the most important part of this. Rewards is just the byproduct of results. Right. The side effect. The side effect. So we, we just tirelessly, we, we pursue results here. We serve the community. Our goal is to serve, to serve, to serve, to serve. Because by serving, then we have more products and services in market. We have more content. We have more reach. We have more respect. Our resume, more people yeah. use us, and it always flows back. I think a lot of times uh, entrepreneurs get confused if they're not getting their the people they're serving, the results, a lot of times. They don't want to take responsibility for that for their clients not getting the results. Yeah. Like if I'm running a gym and my clients aren't getting the results, and like, well, they're just not following my system. Yeah. They're not doing it well. But they're, I think people get caught up in their system and aren't willing to, like you were saying, like put the results first. Because, yeah, I don't know how many gym owners I've talked to in the past where it is that way. And I I felt this way. And like sure. when I was a gym owner in the beginning, it was like the athletes just not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And that's why they're not getting the result. But I, if I would have seen it as, oh, I'm just gonna go and make sure they get the result. We're gonna do whatever it takes yep. so that client gets the result they want. And then when they do get that, yeah, that grows the reputation. But I know a lot of people are so married to the method or married to the thing that they wanna do that they actually never get results for their clients. And then nothing's their fault. Yeah, I mean, they're, yeah. they're married to like, well, I, I only need to go so far. I own, they only paid for so much. Yeah. When really, it comes back to now, you've been cultivating this whole time to up until this point, like, I'm just gonna get the job done. I'm going to exceed expectations. I'm going to solve the problem. That's, that's yeah. the underlying logic, right? I'm always gonna solve the problem. So you get there and you have athletes who are not getting the results. And you're like, oh, well, it's the fucking athlete's fault. They're not following this or that. And it's just like, no, this is an opportunity for you if you've been cultivating that mindset to be like, okay, I have to solve this problem. My, my clients hired me to do something for them and they're not getting the result. That's my problem. That's not their problem. That's my fucking problem if I want to continue to be in business. How do I solve the problem? And continue to ratchet that up. But a lot of people would look from the outside in or people who are in the position of like, well, it's not working for me. I've tried all that. I've done that. I've read the books. It's like, no, it's, and they think maybe you got lucky, right? Luck is what? When preparation meets opportunity. You had been preparing this mindset and this like, this work ethic and this like, I'm just gonna get it fucking done, I'm doing it. And you've been preparing, 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 and then the right opportunity presents itself. You show up already hot, ready to go, and all of a sudden that turns into, hey, I started off cleaning toilets and all of a sudden I'm, you know, who I am today. Yeah. And, and that's, that's an important, I think, distinction for you guys listening who are, man, like this is resonating with me, like take a look at the attitude. Take a look at like, are you really trying to solve the problem or are you just showing up? Yeah. Because the reason you're not moving forward is because you're not, it's, it's, you're not pushing hard enough. You're not, think, you're not thinking outside the box to solve the problem and just get it done. Yeah. Because if you always think that way, it's always an opportunity for me to do this better. Yeah. I could have shown up differently. I should have followed up more. I could have you know, connected more personally with them up front. Whatever that thing is that's missing, like figure it out, get it done, because that's how you're actually gonna break through. If you're hitting a plateau in life, in business, whatever it is, you've hit the ceiling of your like work ethic, your, your skill set. You need to work on that shit and, and strengthen those muscles and, and get past that. Yeah. Only way you're gonna do it is just start doing it. Yeah.
I still clean the toilets. Yeah. You know, I still I still clean the old habits. I still I rearrange. I, I can't <laughs> not. If yeah. something's out of place, I'm going to put it back in place. If the restroom's messy, I'm going to go through and clean it. I'm going to do the things. I, I'm I call, assuming you hire somebody. And we, we have a team that comes in also. So you have, you, you can't walk by it, the But paper. you're not going to walk by something that there's a problem in the business and go, oh, someone else will take care of that. No, of and course you not. You do it. I do it on the oh. spot. And, and hopefully we've cultivated the environment that whoever sees it will do it. And that's why now we're, we're family, family owned, completely family operated mm -hmm. internally. Um, I call it rolling up the hose. You know, you're out there, you're watering your garden, you're doing the thing in the back, and you kind of, you know, you, you leave the hose laying, or you just kind of drag it back, you put it in the mess. The next time you go to use the hose, it's a, it's a mess. It's it's tangled. I don't know how it tangles itself somehow. And it tangled. <laughs> but now it's somehow I hate tangled. Garden. Right? Yeah. And now it's tangled into the mess, and I gotta go through this mess just to do the productive thing I was intending to do. So just buy the hose, it rolls itself. I know. Well, yeah. The shit part about that, too, is that <laughs> that's smart. Like Al Borland talking on TV right, right. now. But that is, that's a step even further in that same right. direction. It's, it's putting protocols of efficiency into place. So now I don't even have to roll the hose and I don't have to worry about it anymore, that's completely off the table because now the, the protocol does it. Yeah. So we have, hopefully, we, we put in protocols in here and continue to do so. We'll go get you some yeah. new hoses. Uh, yeah. yeah. For this. I'm in. Huh? <laughs> from, a, from a productivity standpoint, too, like, it, as a total side note, like, when something like that does happen, if you walk up to the hose and you see it's a mess, there, it's that much more likely that you might go, ah, I'll fucking do it later. Yeah. Like, because you can't just jump into the actual task that you showed up for. You, there's Now there's, like, additional barriers to yeah. doing that thing. And so now it's easier to say, like, well, I just, you know, I'll, I'll fuck it. And yeah. you just don't do it at all because you don't want to go through the headache of, of, like, the pain in the ass part of untangling the hose to get to the thing you actually intended to do. Yeah. I see that happen all the time. Like, if I walk into... Uh, to my garage where I often do a little bit of work if like if there's a bunch of shit on my desk like all of a sudden I just like I'm that much more unmotivated to work if it's just a clean desk and just my laptop I'm like perfect I'll walk mm -hmm. in I'll start working same thing like I have a gym in my garage if there's a bunch of shit on my weightlifting platform I'm like ah oh, god damn I gotta like pick up all these boxes and move them out of the way yep. and, like if it's just a clean weightlifting platform I walk in I'm excited to just get in there and lift yep yeah, a lot of this is I'm speaking to <coughs> improving quality, right? Like if you having a clean space or having yeah. everything put in order is seeking more quality. And I, I think you've done that as a conversation we've had, and you've scaled back some aspects of your operation yeah. seeking higher quality. So we, as we continued to grow as a business, as we scaled and got busier, we started to hire more titles. I was looking more towards a corporate structure. You know, we are a, a corporation, registered corporation, but I was looking more towards the traditional corporate hierarchy of having the C-suites, the, the CEO, the COO, the CMO, the CRO, having them going all the way down through. Also, we're a science team. We have registered dietitians on staff. That's been an important a, a point of differentiation between our team, our system, and most of the others out there in market right now. We have, we have qualified registered professionals doing their jobs in these positions. I made the mistake, now that I look back, of hiring them as full-time employees, giving them all company-paid health care, having a 401k in place for them with a 4% company match. <coughs> this is the package that we offered initially, thinking everybody's going to think like I am. We're going to take your pain points away. I want you to come in here and produce. And there, every, every position had a rev share, essentially, built in for progress, for performance. Mm -hmm. And there's tier to that. So like, yep, tier one, tier two, tier three. Within three years from now, we bang these out. You're, you know, you're sitting at that table with me. That's what I wanted. Yeah. I wanted people that could do what they did as well as I can do what I do. So we can all then, as a team of super friends, kind of focus on the task at hand and run forward. I haven't found that and found that to be very time exhaustive very emotionally exhaustive. You know, gross profit had grown in certain areas, net profit dropped. The time that was being spent on the HR side and managing personalities, fine for some corporations, fine for some businesses, not good for ours. It took my personal touch away, and not that I micromanage things, but there's a standard. There's a standard of excellence, and it's my name on the wall. Trusting other people, I felt they didn't have the same type of of loyalty or pride, and it, you know it embarrasses me sometimes. I have my shirt off on, like on the cover of my book or whatever, and that's kind of how I'm known by some. That's so far from who I truly am, but that's part of the image that you're selling in that product or service. I never saw this Dolce diet fitness thing as being me, one person. It, it's more of a, a collective. So to go through that 
and I had, I had run offices, you know, with, with large staff and, and personnel, and I'd been there and done that, and it was, you know, different sector, and it was the same mentality. So I've, I've managed hundreds of people, and it's the same mentality. Very rarely do you see the one person who actually breaks free. Yeah. And, and, and excels. So with us, we've kind of changed and, you know, just through attrition and people leave and not the right fit and whatnot. And great things to say is people, anyone who's come through here, but now it, it, it's strictly independent contractor. You kill what you eat in this company. And that's the best thing. So now people, and we do performance reviews. If you talk to one of our staff member, members, I'm going to find out about how that was, how that interaction was, because shit, we got dozens, we got stacks of resumes to fill those spots. Rarely do we fill the spots anymore because the people that work with us are fucking awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've actually heard of people making, uh, business owners making almost the employment situation too comfortable. Um, Guilty, and they, 100%. And, and then when they, they get to the point in the business where they have to let that person go, I've heard of the employees getting angry because they can't find it as good where they had it. Yeah. It's like they leave and they go, oh, I'm going to go find a similar type of job and find out they're, they're going to get paid a lot less than yep. they were getting paid. And it's like you made it, too, you made it so cushy. And you thought, you know, I've, I've had the same situation where it's like, oh, if we just take care of all their needs, then they won't, they'll be able to focus only on this. Yep. But at the same time, if it doesn't go well, then when they leave, they're like, now it's your fault yeah. that, uh, that it got so cushy. And now I'm going to have to take a pay cut. I can't get paid doing what I was doing the way I was doing it. Yep. Yeah. And that's, we felt a lot of everyone, not, our, not everyone, but there's a majority of those who had left us were mad at us resentful, if you will, I think because of what you said. Yeah. You can come in anytime you want. Just get your job done, get it on deadline. You're getting paid for X amount of hours per week. Nobody's checking your hours. We're checking your progress. You treat people the way that I would treat them, the way that they deserve to be treated. Paycheck was always there. Healthcare was always there. Everything was always there. And then open time off. You need time off, take time off. Let it be legitimate, but don't let any of your job slip. So very flexible, you know? Athletic, you know, if we have guests in the office, then there's a little more company decorum at that point. But on the average day, multiple days, you know, you know, 16 out of the 20 work days per month, you know, gym gear, whatever you want to be comfortable and not really open to flip flop feet. I'm not really wanting to stare at that all day, and you know, in case people do walk through, but closed toe shoes, but athletic, and that was kind of the, the deal. Not a bad place to work. And it just wasn't ideal. And maybe they're like, oh, that dude's a fucking crazy dickhead. I might be. I don't know. I've never worked for me. <laughs> but I do have expectations, and it is my name on the wall. Yeah. But I met every, you know, every part of my, you know, contractual obligation. Paycheck was always there. The environment was always what it was supposed to be. So we've done everything. We just didn't find the same match. And I think I, because I deal with a lot of other business owners and entrepreneurs. HR is the biggest thing. Most business owners I know, they spend more time managing their staff than they do working on their product services and serving their client base, their community. Mm -hmm. And that's the disconnect. Mm -hmm. But it's a hard thing because, you know, this goes back to the poor mentality. That people have this poor mentality, this entitlement, this I deserve, I show up every day, I deserve this. Look at the profits of the company. I deserve to get a little bit more. You deserve nothing. Nobody deserves anything. You, you deserve what you accept. I did a, or had a recent conversation uh, with a gentleman and we were talking about UFC pay structure, professional you know, fighting pay structure. And you know, his point was, very valid point, that your, net, your worth, your value, your market value is what someone will pay. And I countered, I said, no, even further, your value is what you'll actually accept. Someone could offer me $10 to work 100 hours. No, if I needed $10 to live, to feed my family, to get, you know, whatever, then yeah, that becomes worth it at that point. But it's what you actually accept. Most people accept so much less for themselves, then they get mad at the person, like they get mad at Dana White for giving them 10 and 10. Well, you signed the contract. You said yes, you could have said no and walked away and done something else. Oh, but that's all they were gonna pay. So that's your value, that's your worth. You've set your worth. So it's not what they offer you, it's what you actually accept. And if people would stand up for themselves a little bit more or take the accountability onto themselves, then they would drive that number up much higher. They have a much higher value. This, this you know, you get political, this livable wage, this $15 minimum wage, what's your, what's your certification? What's, what are you giving? And I don't care if you're, you're schooled or not. What's your contribution to the business, to the bottom line, to get to that point? 
well, that's how much I need to take care of my family. Maybe you need to work somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need to get a, a qualification, a certification, something else, develop skills, talents, resources, opportunities to go and do that. that that's my mm. stance. And I think I'm allowed to say that because of my background. I didn't say, oh, I need help. I need, you know, we need food stands. We need, you know, government services. No, we don't need any of that. We're going to fucking work our ass off and we're going to earn it. And we, we do. We did. I've heard that expression said a couple of different ways. Like, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you accept. Yeah. Uh, I've also heard it say, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. Yeah. Which is kind of the same, same thing, thing, right? A little you, more shrewd. Yeah. You, it, <laughs> in, in, in one sense, like, some people don't negotiate. They'll, they'll be offered a contract and they'll just say, oh, okay. Yeah. And they just, they just like, even if it's not like a contract, like a UFC contract where you're signing up for a four or five deal or whatever it is, like yeah. anytime you sign up to work for somebody, they're going to say, hey, your salary is 60 grand a year. And that doesn't mean it's 60 grand a year. That's, they, some people think when they're employed that like they have no negotiating power yeah. and they don't even try to, to negotiate. Yeah. And so they just accept it and they don't think they can get another job. They, so they just say, oh, okay, I guess that, that's all they offer. And they don't even try to negotiate. Yeah. Um, it's a scary thing to do for a lot of people to, especially if they don't feel like they're in a position of power or this person's an authority or that like there's no dynamic where they have the the right frame where they think they can even speak up and not like get in trouble as an example. But but yeah, there, there's there's essentially no rules. Like you can you can negotiate and if you do it well, then you can you can make more money. And then as you said, you know you can always say no. Yeah. And sometimes that's hard to do, but it's always an option. Absolutely. When I I remember getting like when I would try to get jobs like in my 20s to like fill in between ventures where I would try something or not do as well as I thought or needed to or whatnot and I'm like okay I got to get a job They're like okay we'll pay you 60 grand a year to do this and I'm like I want to make 80 is that possible is there any way that I can create more value anywhere else like what else can I do could I get to 80 is it possible they'd be like well I, I guess I didn't really think about it I guess you could do this or this or this could I get to 100 well I don't know I I suppose so. If you if you really wanted to bust it out, like, and I guess you could, like, if you get this qualification and you hit these numbers, like, I guess technically you could. Cool, I'll take it. Because it was a matter of like I needed to make it happen. Yeah. Mixed with I also know that because I've been rehearsing the same thing you've been rehearsing of just I I know that I can make it happen. Yeah. I know that I will show up and outwork and out hustle anybody in the fucking building if I want it. So I will show up and be like, is it possible? That's all I need to know. Got it. That's it. I love it. Right. Yeah. And then just get to work. Yeah. I think a lot of people think negotiating is like, I'll offer you 60 and you go, 65, and they go, no, and you go, yeah. What I got out of this most was just how the results and are lead to the reputation. A lot of times people think about reputation and, and really just think about how good of a person I am and really think about this, the results that build that. Yeah, the, the message on you know the, the employee mindset and just making sure even though you may be an employee for someone, having that entrepreneurial drive and, and treating it as your opportunity, like I'm here to provide value, how can I do that, what, what can I do to keep moving it forward, I think is a huge takeaway for our audience. Yeah, I, I think a big thing for me, um, not just a reminder, but like, like a real big takeaway for me personally is that no matter what my situation is, since, especially since I can't control my situation, it all comes down to my behavior. That's the thing that I, I can control. So the answer is just to get back to work and just keep grinding, work harder, work smarter, and that's what I can control. Just focus on that and just as best I can forget about the situation and just focus on me and what I actually can control myself. Absolutely. I, I hope. What I, I get, what I see is we are products, our environment, but our, our environment doesn't define us, right? Or it, it makes us who we are, but it doesn't make us stay where we are. So surrounding yourself with positive, supportive people that have that bigger, brighter message, reading books and stories and sites and YouTube videos and podcasts that have that bigger message, that's what will lift you from that poor mentality. Because that's all it is. It's, it's not your surroundings. That doesn't matter. But those who surround you, those external forces or circumstances and messaging and visuals, that can change your mentality. So it's very important to fill your mind, fill your life, fill your, your world with that positive mentality, that, that rich, that abundant mentality. Where can Absolutely. people find more about what you're doing? Uh, you just go to thedolcediet.com. If you go to the Dolce Diet anywhere, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, thedolcediet.com, or the Mike Dolce Show, our podcast. Yep. Yeah, give that a listen, folks. And if you've enjoyed this and you're listening on iTunes, go over to iTunes, give us a five-star review, positive comment. And we've got a lot of new videos coming out on YouTube all the time. Make sure to go subscribe to our channel over there.